Hi there, everyone. Um, good evening and welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, here at Mus Music Supports um, Addiction and Support and Recovery event as part of the Addiction Awareness Week. We're, um, we're, we've come together with a number of other charities to take action on, on addiction. And the call out really is about calling for addiction to be treated as a serious mental health condition and encouraging more access to treatment, more access to support, and more access to care so that anyone living with addiction could know that actually re recovery is possible. Really, really happy that you've joined us. Uh, my name is Norman Beecher. I am Music Support Senior Learning and Development Specialist. And um, what that means is I have oversight of our training department, our learning and development department, where we provide um, training in mental health first aid, um, in addiction and recovery, which we'll talk about more in a little while. We also um, provide training in self-care and self-awareness and just sort of general well-being. So what is Music Support? We are a charity that provides help and support to anyone, and that's anyone, in the UK music and events uh, and live events who are affected by mental health and or addiction. And as I mentioned earlier, some of our core services include training in mental health first aid, training in addiction and recovery. We also have an, a confidential helpline, which is run by peers with lived experience. And um, the helplines open from nine to five daily. We also provide um, a safe space at festivals. Um, there are safe hubs for artists and crew who might need support. And again, you can find all this information on our website at music support dot org and Lynn will type that into the chat for you now. Before I introduce my amazing panel and I have an amazing panel here this, this evening, um, just want to say that we've been discussing addiction this, this evening, which I know can sometimes be triggering to people. So if you are triggered and you want to speak to someone and you can you can always call our helpline and again just a reminder, it's open Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The number is 0800-030-6789. And that's 0800-030-6789. And again, let me put that in the chat for you right now. So let's begin. So I have uh, three lovely, lovely people here with me today. I have music educator, Rachel Parsons, tour manager, Susie Green, and musician, Jack Fordry. And I'm gonna ask you guys to introduce yourselves and just, just say a little bit about what you do and why is the topic of addiction so important to you? And Jack, I'll start with you. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Jack. I sing and write music, play guitar in a band called Tova. Um, I also produce rock and metal bands in England and overseas. Um, and the topic of addiction is so important to me because it's something that affected my life from a very uh, young age and has been something that I felt quite lonely with having gotten sober um, in my mid twenties and knowing no one else that was sober. Mm. Lovely. Thank you. And Rachel. Hi, um, my name's Rachel. I am a musician and a community, um, community musician. I've played in bands for over, over 25 years. So I've had t like 20 years as a drummer, touring, recording, gigging, playing festivals. And I've also been working with young people for 20 years as a youth worker, um, FE lecturer and a community musician supporting young bands and artists, musicians, technicians, sound engineers in their early stages of um, their careers in the Northwest. So I work at More Music um, as a youth programmes manager, which is a music and education charity in Morecambe. Um, and we deliver inclusive music making um, projects for young people who 
live in challenging circumstances in loads of different settings. Um, and I also, we uh, work over the past five years has focused more and more around mental health. Um, so I'm a mental health first aider and a key partner in our mental health champions, mental health champions network. Um, so we work very closely with them. We do an annual um, event in December where we work um, in partnership with CAMS and our local mental health charities to celebrate young people's resilience and the power of music and creativity to support positive mental health. Um, and addiction is important to me because on a on a personal level, I lost my partner in 2008, who was also in the industry, drummed for many years. Um, and yeah, he lost his life to addiction. So it's pers on a personal level, very important to me. And um, kind of on a professional level, I'm supporting young people to go into the music industry. And so I want to support it to become a, a safe environment for them in the future. Lovely. Thank you so much and welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, Susie. Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm a tour manager. I've worked in the business on and off for about 25 years, um, which makes me very, very old. <laughs> and I've worked on all kinds of different tours and on with all sorts of people during that time. Um, and I guess I'm Addiction, has been, addiction and recovery as well um, are very much something I've been interested in because it's something I've come across. Um, addiction in various um, stages and not quite knowing what to do, how I could help. And likewise, having colleagues and working with bands who are in recovery and wanting to know how to support their recovery as well. Um, I also run a peer support group, which started at the beginning of COVID called The Back Lounge. Um, which was something I just started as a way to connect with other people because um, I knew I was freaking out at the start of COVID. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah, it's now become a yeah. pretty big community of about two and a half thousand people. People come and go and it's for anyone who works in live music. And uh, addiction does come up a lot in our discussions. So, yeah, thank you for having me here. Thank you. And I, I just want to add here as well that you were instrumental. As I, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we, we provide um, in, in terms of training was that is that workshop on addiction and recovery. And just how instrumental you were in the beginning of to, in helping us to shape that and get it out there and, and providing the funds, fund, <laughs> the initial funding that we were able to, to make it free of charge for. And it still is free of charge now actually because of funding um, that we've got to, to keep it going. And as a result of that, we have now trained in excess of 200 people in the last year, which is, which is phenomenal, really. Um, yeah, so thank you, I, I guess is what I want to say, for being instrumental in, in, in that. And, and, and folks, you can find out more about um, our Addiction and Recovery Workshop by visiting our website. Um, my colleague Lynn has just typed it in the chat. Again, it's free of charge. And just, yeah, get on the website and fill out the application form and, and we'll be in touch. All right, let's get started with this conversation about addiction. So as, as you know, this is Addiction Awareness Week and Addiction Awareness Week uh, came about because uh, it really is about, you know, a group of addiction-focused charities coming together and saying, we need to make, make, it, make treatment accessible to people who are living with addictions. We need to, to destigmatize addiction, recognize it for the mental health issue it is. So we are two days into Addiction Awareness Week, and I just want to ask you, Susie, uh, to what extent would you say there's an issue with addiction in, in, in the music industry right now? Um, <clears throat> without wanting to uh, fall on old cliches, um, I guess it's sex, drugs and rock and roll, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and whilst it might not still have the image like it once did, um, it's still um, very much there. Um, I think it's an industry that attracts all kinds of different people um, and quite often people that maybe are a little bit on the edge already. Um, mm. 
creativity or wanting to just live a different lifestyle. Um, and because the whole nature of, I mean, my world is touring and touring especially, you are in environments where you have access to pretty much anything you want. And whether mm. drugs, alcohol, or something like gambling, or you're much less accountable because you're away from home, you're away from your support networks. And it's quite easy to hide in that business. Mm. So I would say, yes, we still have a problem. There's still a lot of work to do. So, 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 so uh, as much as things are changing, there's still a lot of change yet to come. But you're right. I think I think there is there's a gradual shift, isn't there, from that old sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and the musician having to be off its head to to perform. That there's a quite a shift moving away from that image to something more along the lines of actually we don't need to be doing that. And I hear that from the younger people that's coming coming through now. That actually, you know, people, are, the younger ones are wising up and saying, actually, no, no, we don't want to be a part of that. But do you say that, that, that that's true from what you, you see? And I guess I could ask that of you, Rachel. Is that something that you're noticing in the younger generation? Coming? I would, sorry, no, I would say that having worked kind of in with young people and in, in music and live events for um again like Susie in over 20 years there's been a there has been a definite positive shift um in young people and um their drinking habits mm. their smoking habits is it is I would I'd say it's less less prominent at the age in the age range that I work with so like kind of 12 to 25 year olds they're less likely to go to the pub for various reasons. I think there's been a change in a shift in kind of society and culture. Lots of people stay at home gaming. <laughs> Things people aren't drinking on the streets as much as they used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a good, you know, that's a good thing. Um, so certainly, kind of young people do seem to be a lot more sensible than perhaps my generation were. Yeah. Which is a yeah. good thing, but um, yeah, it's not to say that there isn't still. Yeah, there's work to do yet. There's work to do yet. And part of that, and, and I'll st stick with you, Rachel, for this. So part of that is, bec is because of the way, I guess, you know, the work, could, the reason there's still work to be done is that the way addiction is perceived um, as, as some sort of moral failing or some sort of weakness or, or that it's some sort of choice that like people choose to behave the way they do. And part of the addiction, um, the campaign taken on addiction, taken action on addiction is about um, changing the way that addiction is perceived. That actually it's not this sort of moral failing. It's not this weakness. Is that generally within the music industry how addiction is still perceived as well? I think that it's some sort of weakness or... I think from, yeah, from my experience and again, kind of, you know, 10 years ago, perhaps it were addiction was seen certainly as a, as a choice. Mm. I was told by people, you know, that's their choice that they're drinking. Um, and when in fact, you know, your, your training has been invaluable for me and has educated me in the fact that, you know, it isn't a choice. Um, and it, it's a, it's a mental health issue. So, yeah, I, well, I would say so. Yeah, so so it's gen you feel it's still generally feel um, perceived as some sort of weakness, and of course, if 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 it's a weakness, then the antidote is to get strong, <laughs> and of course, people who are really struggling with addiction and living with addiction, feeling like they can't do this alone, they must, and they feel they they they're, they're bound to hide it. Are they? They're bound to hide it and, and, and not sort of speak up and say, look, I'm struggling. If it's perceived as some sort of weakness and moral failing. And I, and I think that's, that's at the, the sort of heart of what we're trying to do here is to destigmatize that. Did you want to say something else, Rachel? Go ahead. Yeah, go easy. No, it's fine. Oh, sorry. I, did, I couldn't help myself. I had to put my hand up. No, that's, that's absolutely fine. Let's just have a conversation. That's what we're here for. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, I think it's really interesting because there is so much stigma. And I'm thinking 
from the point of view of a tour manager um, and when I hire crew, because I think and it'd be interesting to hear Jack's point of view on this. Obviously, artists is one thing, but with crew, we're all freelance. And I know definitely there is a real stigma attached with people who are at whatever part of their journey and they might be in recovery, but they're still very much tainted with this kind of image of can we rely on them? Are, are they going to fall off the wagon on our watch? Um, is mm. it that we employ someone else because of that? Um, and I think that's something we really have to fight. I think it's very interesting now there's such a shortage of crew as to whether that might be one of the reasons we overcome that rather than a sort of purer reason, if you like. Mm. Actually, no, let's try and understand what this journey is and support it. What a, what a really good point you make there about, you know, someone in recovery who might not be hired because of, of fear that they may fall off the wagon. And, and the, the truth is, hiring someone in recovery, what you, you're actually doing is you're hiring someone who you, you at least know is somewhat reliable. <laughs> because, because that, you, you know, so, so I guess the shift needs to be away from they may fall off the wagon to... Actually, this person is reliable. I know for me, I, you know, I, I'm 33 years in recovery myself. I'm a hell of a lot more reliable now than I ever was 33 years ago. You know, I show up and, 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 and I show up time and time again. And, and, and you can depend on me. If I say I'm going to be somewhere, I'll be there. So um, I, I, I guess what I'm saying here is the shift, there needs to be a shift, I guess, um, from they may fall off the wagon to actually I'll hire someone in recovery because actually they they might be pretty reliable. <laughs> yeah, is that what you're saying, Susan? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is the fact that people aren't hired, even if they're the right person for the job and they're really skilled at what they do because they have a history. Yeah. History is known. So they failed, if you want to call it failure, once. And yeah. they might yeah. fail again. Yeah. Um, and that's something I think we need to, to change. change. Yeah. Definitely. Jack, I want to ask you. So I know, Jack, you openly talk about your recovery. I watched you on Sober Dave's podcast. Again, I just want to say just how inspiring that, that talk it was. And um, so, so, so Dave actually introduced you as one of the nicest people he's ever met. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you've had lived experience of addiction and you're now in recovery. Um, how did you do it? Um, <clears throat> well, I think the, it, it's very strange because it wasn't a, it wasn't really a very overly dramatic situation. And I think, and I think I spoke about this on the, on Dave's podcast is that people like on, um, on TV and, and stuff and like in soap operas and all that stuff make it seem like it's this kind of like life ending kind of like you've hidden a bottle of vodka in your pillow and you're crying and drinking it at night and, and then you throw it out the window and it's all done. It's, it's not that it, it's, I think you get to a stage where you feel you have a moment where you're too tired yeah. to, to argue with yourself. And I think oh, that's what happened to me was that I was sat down in a pub um, and, <clears throat> and I was sat in front of a drink and I turned to the person I was with and I was just like, I, I can't do this anymore. I was like, I cannot do this anymore. And I just kind of broke down and I was just like, I'm just killing myself by doing this. And I, and I had tried to stop before, but, there wasn't really an incentive. And I think there wasn't an incentive bigger than the overriding feeling that I didn't want to be sober. Um, and, and I feel like that's a, a misconception is that people think that you're just doing it to have a good time or yeah. that you're just doing it because it's what you're in music or that you're doing it because of, th there are a load of reasons that, are tip of the iceberg I think the whatever the issues are start when you're young and I think they start from having a predisposition to, to be an, an addict is obviously a thing but 
wanting to escape from something or run away from something. Um, there was a lot of stuff for me that I tried to run away from. And I think as soon as I started drinking, um, it came, it became very apparent that that was a, that was a really quick, I always called it, it's almost like instant therapy. It's just like, there's no need to do X, Y, and Z when you can just, you can just get drunk or get high and then you're kind of, then you're all right. And I feel like it just took, I, I, I kind of started, I'd never touched a drink in my life until I was 16. And then from 16, like say for just 10 years straight, I, I was, I, without exaggeration was drunk more days than I was sober for a decade. And I think when I stopped, I was like, well, I can either stop at 26 and not have ruined my life or I can keep going. And, and I don't think anyone ever sits on the deathbed and goes, God, I wish I'd been drunk more. You yeah, know, like, yeah. I don't think that's ever happened. I think people think, oh, I wish I'd had a better time or I wish I'd have done this or blah, blah, blah. There, there is, there is no, there is no positive end game with drinking. Um, and that's why I, that's, that's all of those kind of little reasons kind of built up and that's how I did it. Um, if I hadn't stopped that day, I'd still be drinking now. I, I, yeah. I, I think, um, but it was spontaneous, I suppose, but it was like, it felt like it was a long time coming at the same time. I don't yeah, know. If that's yeah. Kind of yeah. 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 I, I remember, I remember a little statement you made on that podcast. You said you got to a point where it, there was just a moment. I, I guess it was a moment of clarity where you said, that's enough, Jack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the words you use. That's enough now, Jack. And, and I, I just thought that was brilliant because for me, that was kind of the, the, the way it was too. There was nothing really dramatic. And again, I, I guess that's the message I also want to pass on that it doesn't have to be something dramatic that happens that makes you stop. You know, I I had had numerous <laughs> near near misses, numerous brushes. I, you know, really devastating stuff. Lost jobs and girlfriends and and crashed cars and the rest of it. And there was just that moment of clarity where I disappointed one person too many. And I thought this is it. And just like you said, that's enough, Jack. It was like that's enough, Norman, and and I and I sought help. So again, I, the message I, I guess we want to pass out there is that, you know, you may not necessarily think you're there yet because there's not not been anything massive that's happened, but you don't have to wait for that big thing to happen. It could be, yeah, that moment of clarity. Yeah. Um, there is a. Um... I was, I was reading about something recently and it's this kind of bias where a human being will automatically protect themselves from feeling like they're in harm's way more so than thinking that someone else is in harm's way. It's like, you never would imagine that you would get an illness or you yeah. would never imagine that you would, um, you know, have an, have an accident, for example, because it's, that's how our brain protects us and, and allows us to do certain things. And I think there yeah. are, even though, you can see people is there's death all around you when you are not to be well to be incredibly morbid i suppose like living in like drug dens and being legally homeless and 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 having friends die for, um of overdoses all of those things that happen you can obviously people go why didn't you stop when this happened why didn't you stop when this happened it's like well because the addiction itself is is selfish and you have this you have this innate kind of ability to go oh well that won't happen to me because mm. I'm me, I'm not that person. So I'm I, those things won't happen. And and I think there are there are um, just it's just enough. I think it's just when it when just enough things happen for you to have that moment of clarity. I feel like um, I I tried stopping when my friend unfortunately passed away of a drug overdose. Um, and one of the he was actually in a band with myself and the guys that I'm now uh, that I now I'm in a band with. And, um, and he died and, and, but the reaction when he died was to just get wasted uh, every day for two, three weeks to try and process it. And, um, and that's when I tried to cut down and tried to do it in moderation. And then again, it got to a point where it was every day. And then I realized that I couldn't moderate it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You, you had a really good point that we discussed in our workshop actually about that, that place between um, 
where you sort of drinking, you know, using and abusing substances to the point where you, you, you're, you're now an addict and unable to predict what will happen once you start drinking. And that's kind of what I'm hearing you say there. You, 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 you've tried to cut down and you've tried to do all kinds of manner, all manner of things to stop. But you hadn't really got the that that knowledge yet. You didn't really get to that point yet where you really, really fully understood that you'd lost the, the ability to, to predict what would happen mm-hmm. once you start using. And once you got there, was there in that moment of clarity happened? I guess. Well? Yeah, I think I, th- I think it was. Um, I feel that perhaps my situation may be different to to some other people's because I knew I was an addict for. Um, I, I probably knew I was an addict for, for say like three, two, two years or so before I stopped. Um, I, I, I'd kind of given up on being in denial with it and just thought this is kind of just what, what my life it will be. And I think that the, yeah, the, the level of the level of, of tiredness that I think my, my body had kind of like endured for such a long time was that tipping point was the the thing I mentioned where I was again so tired I couldn't argue with myself to carry on and I realized that every single so I tried to drink once every two weeks and this could be something as well that if anyone's watching as anyone's thinking about um to be blunt if you are watching something because you're curious that you might have a problem with something you have a problem with something like there, there is, there is no two ways around it. Like every single time I talk to anybody who is, uh, who I can, I can, I can spot, I can spot an addict a mile off. Um, and when someone talks to me about something and they like, Oh, so when did you get sober? I was like, people that don't, people that don't have problems with substances don't ask that question. Like they, they, they don't, unless it's in a situation where you are, you know, people don't say, Oh, so how did you, stop drinking or blah, blah, blah. It's almost like people are looking for that. You know, like when you watch TV and it's like, oh, this, this miracle pill got me in shape really quickly. It's like, how did you do that? It's like, it's, there are, there are so many ways that you can kind of spot these things. And I think if you are interested in being sober, then you, you should be. (laughs) Yeah, a social drinker doesn't stop to think, am I drinking too much? Yeah. No, 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 not at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. A social drinker doesn't pick yeah. up a pack of beer on the way home because it's yeah, yeah. not enough, you know, so. Hey, Rachel um, and, and Susie, or, or Susie, so Jack's just talked about being in recovery in the industry. He's in the industry, he's in recovery. And I'm just curious, what do you think that the music industry in general can be doing to support people in recovery? Do you want to take this one? Either of you. (laughs) Okay, I'll start. Um, I would say it's probably about education. Um, I think, uh, not that I want to just be constantly plugging the amazing course you run, but I think that's a really great start. I think if people just understood a little bit more about almost like the mechanics of addiction, um, would help remove some of the stigma and would you know understanding i think would bring everything um rather than trying to either glorify it um if it's an artist or just sweep it under the carpet or ignore it and look elsewhere if it's something behind the scenes i think we've done that for too long as well it's time for change i also think we have a responsibility with you know new people you know as rachel was saying people coming in um and younger people maybe having a lot less of you know that drinking culture drug culture than you know my generation might have had but then I also know that again if you're away from home and you're with a bunch of people and they're older than you um you're quite often subject to peer pressure and if the go-to thing is is oh let's all get on one you know as soon as the show's down and that maybe that's not your thing, but if you're with a bunch of people and you're kind of new and you're not quite secure in your position, I think that's an issue as well. So the more we can talk about this, that the more people, you know, will feel confident enough to go, you know what, I pass on that. Mm, really lovely. Did you want to add anything to that at all, Rachel? That's 
<laughs> no, I think um, I think Susie's kind of said what what I would say: raising awareness and um, your training is great um, to to do that and um, kind of uh, raise, raising awareness of where people can go for support or to ask those questions if mm. they are if they are concerned about themselves or others um, and kind of you know better access to healthcare as well perhaps on a grander scale yeah and yeah that's that's another another conversation altogether isn't it Uh, you know in terms of access Uh, jack for someone sort of new in recovery so early days they've just stopped drinking still a bit shaky and they're trying to navigate their way around drug and alcohol use on tours um different events, award ceremonies, and all of that, what advice would you give them in order to sort of keep themselves safe? I would say that something that you can, something that you can, that you could start start with, I think, is not expecting to find yourselves in the same situations that you normally would on a tour. For, for example, the first tour I did sober um, was so different from the tour previous when I was, when I was using. And I think it was an unfair, um, it was an unfair expectation that I think I'd put on myself um, that I would still be going out until two in the morning with people, but I would just do it, but I'd just be sober or I'd still find myself in ridiculous places with, with the lads in the band or with another band, or we'd still end up, meeting x y and z from whoever in this trailer at 2 a.m and blah blah blah. i think i thought everything will just i'll just kind of be the same Mm. i won't drink and when i stopped it was literally the last thing i wanted to do because i quickly realized that there are a large amount of things that you do in your life just to facilitate the drinking or, or drugs so if there is a situation where you're invited to do something and there is there is nothing to do apart from drinking or standing around taking drugs. If there's no activity involved aside from those things, then I think the best thing to do is just to say not to go, to, to, to take yourself back to wherever you're staying. And I think depending on what, what part of your career you're in or what type of music you make will obviously, where you're sleeping will drastically differ. Um, I think, you know, you it, it becomes easier when you are it becomes easier when you're in a more comfortable of a situation you know when you're not sleeping on the floor of a van or something that is almost a necessity to get drunk for for me that was and as and as things have progressed and I've been able to stay in hotels and and whatever it's become easier to to take myself back and that's I still do that now you know after a show um and, and it's five and a half years in, but I remember reading Bryony Gordon's book, um, Glorious Rock Bottom. And she was talking about like she said, the first five years, it's it's almost like you should have like L plates on. Uh, that's how I feel. Like I had for up until I'm going to say about six months ago, is I had no idea how to navigate it. And I think I've only really got answers to those things recently. I think it, there is no harm in taking yourself away from the situation you're in um once you've finished being in the situation you know if you're performing or you're part of a part of crew or something you can take yourself away um and do something i would say do something for yourself that you enjoyed doing before the addiction took over so like i, I think when my addiction was at its at its height um i had finished a bunch of tours i, I was i'd finished university for playing music and I could not remember the last time I'd picked up an instrument to practice it because I didn't care. And then when I stopped, I was like, oh, I love music. Mm. And so I'll go back, we'll finish a show. And, and it's really annoying to everyone else, but we'll finish a show on tour and I'll go home and put my headphones on and make music until one in the morning when if everyone else has gone out having a drink because they're all super supportive of me, but yeah. they're all not sober. Um, so I'll go back with our tour manager who obviously has the short straw and has to drive. And then we'll kind of like watch like really bad, t- you know, like TV, like on free view and stuff in hotel rooms and make music on the laptops and get too much chocolate or something. Like, I think there are, there are things you can do where you can still really enjoy yourself and you don't have the pressure around you. And it's just about taking yourself out of that environment to start with. Um, that's, that's don't, don't go to wear the spoons. Just don't yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's a real fear, though, isn't there? Um, 
that somehow I won't be as creative mm. if I'm sober. I won't be able to make the kind of music. People oftentimes equate uh, creativity with drugs and, and, you know, getting high and, and all of that. And, and, and I guess what you're saying, that's all a myth. Oh, completely. <laughs> if, you, if you read of, or listen to any interviews that the Beatles did where people have said that, oh, my God, well, you have to have done this creatively because of X, Y, and Z. They, a lot of the time have said that they took a lot of drugs, yeah. um, recorded stuff, and it was terrible. And it was when they were more straight that they made music that okay. sounded great. And, and I think that is stemming from something that long ago. Um is still that myth. It's like, oh, well, the Beatles made this music because they were on acid or something. That seems to be the excuse for it. And I think I have listened back to music I've made when I've been on drugs and, and drinking. It's all, it's awful. It's so bad. You think it's great. And, and, and playing the same song for 25 minutes while staring at your drummer, not blinking. That's not cool. <laughs> like, I've done that loads. Like, I've been like, I'm the best. It's like, that's just drugs, that's just drugs man. Um, but yeah, in, in the first lockdown, I wrote 120 songs. I I'd saved them on my computer, just numbered them. Like, there is no way I would have done that if I was using. Mm. There absolutely no way. So yeah. it's a complete myth. Complete myth, man. Brilliant. Thank you. Rachel, you've attended our um, addiction and recovery workshop. Can you, you, we talked about just now raising awareness, yeah? That, that part of that, and that's just one aspect of it, you know, raising awareness through education. Can you say a little bit about what, you, what that experience was like for you on the workshop? And, and I guess, what was your main takeaway? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really enjoyed the workshop. So it's, it's a very enjoyable um session and it's really um informative and educational i really like the science um behind addiction um i'm big not a big fan of but i'm fascinated by the brain um and so there, you uh talk a lot about like neurotransmitters and the kind of the impact of addiction and how the brain reacts so that's really i think um that's one of the key things that i seem to be taking away from all all the training that I'm doing recently, like we're doing a lot of trauma informed practice as well. Um, and I feel like the two are perhaps linked, but it's a lot to do. So the brain brain science behind that and all the models are really, um, really good. I found those really practical tools that could be used um, for like spotting signs if someone um, that you work with is struggling. Um, and they might not spot the signs themselves. That um, I can't remember what the model's called, but there's some really practical tools that um, can be could be used by anyone that does the training. I think to support their colleagues. Lovely, thank you. Uh, how about you, Susie? Was was that similar experience for you? I know you. Well, you attended. You were like on the pilot pilot um, workshop, yeah. weren't you? You know what's really interesting um, about the pilot. And then finding that this has carried on through, sounds like every single course you've run since, um, living, hearing people's lived experience, having, uh, I mean, we had a couple of people actually on, on the course I did, talking about what it had been like for them. And that was so powerful, having someone mm. there in front of you talk about, you know, the depths to how they crawled out of that. And that, I, that really affected me and I've thought about that a lot since. Um, I also found the signposting really useful because again, it's that thing of when you're faced with this um, and you want to know how you can be of service to people, you don't always know what to do. Um, so first of all, it's, it's the understanding, isn't it? And then having, you know, at least names of organizations that might then be helpful and obviously you can't make people, you know, choose to go into recovery, but you can at least know that you understand you're someone to talk to, the listening skills. Yeah, well. really yeah. Cool. So uh, approaching with empathy rather than sort of approaching it with, you know, pull up your socks, man, and get on. You know, I can't tell you how many times um, during my active addiction, people would say, Norman, for God's sakes, Get yourself together, man. 
And, you know, I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to be that guy that people had to constantly be saying, pull yourself together. You know, what's wrong with you? If I knew what was wrong with me, I would have done something about it. So there is there is this thing about learning about the addiction, the process of addiction, what happens, and then what you can do to, to guide someone towards um, support. It's, it's That's the main aim, isn't it? And I'm hearing that's what you've got. So that's that's brilliant. <laughs> brilliant to hear it. Um, we're, we're coming close up to time, but and we've got a few more. Well, we've got a couple of questions. But before we take questions, there's just one last thing I want to ask. And this is for anybody. And we, we started to talk about generally what the industry could do to support recovery. Um, is there anything, so, so, you know, is there anything generally that you would say, you know, we talked about awareness. Is there anything else, I guess, is what I'm saying. So we talked about raising awareness through education. Is there anything else? Um, I, I was, I was going to say that I think raising awareness through education is a great thing for people that are outwardly seeking uh, to get help or other type of people that are seeking to help others. And that is great. But I feel as if there are more people willing to help people with addictions than there are addicts trying to get help in those situations because it's easier to be someone that can help somebody. And I think from being on both sides of it, there's, it's, it's way easier for me to offer advice to somebody than it is to, to take advice from somebody else. And I feel like it would be a really useful thing thinking back to times where I felt extremely lonely because as I mentioned before, taking myself away from something is, mm. it's been, it's been a good thing to do, but it would often be the other way around where I would be the last one up because yeah. of the addiction and having something, a, a community of people that I, that I don't need to have the pressure of, of maybe meeting up with or not be able to, if you're on tour, for example, or whatever that you could, maybe you know talk to somebody in a in a in a comment of something or in like a, almost like a whatsapp group i suppose but for i think have, having something where you could be like i'm in a really kind of dark place or i've relapsed or i'm sober but i'm struggling with this this and this just to get a few messages of, of um support from people that are in that have experienced addiction themselves i think is really mm. useful yeah. um and, and it's not a, a snobbery i suppose but i think it's you deep down feel like somebody that hasn't had a problem with addiction won't understand how you feel. Um, and that's not true at all, but yeah. it's just how you feel. It's just another defense mechanism, I think. Sure. Um, so having a, yeah, having, having a, an, an open situation, something that's online and I'm sure there are many things, but again, like you said about the awareness, it's, it's knowing where they are and how to access yeah. it. Yeah. Um, having a supportive community. That's so, so I guess I'm hearing providing a space, a space maybe even on tours and stuff like that where there can be sober activities yeah. going on. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and very quickly, Susie and Rachel, is that something you would agree with as well? I think, yeah, on tours. Um, just little things like if it's a day off, and there's an acti activity planned, um, that it's not something that immediately involves going somewhere for drinking. Because mm. if there's people in your, you know, in your touring party that that's not their thing, then immediately they're excluded. Yeah, 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 yeah. brilliant, yeah. Yeah, and I think as well, um, providing alternatives, um, which whether that's on the rider, um, having other things other nice drinks to have that isn't just yeah. water or coca-cola you know yeah. rather than sort of that thing where you know if you're in recovery you're just missing out you're just missing out you know yeah. go off with your lemonade um and i think to which you were saying it's having community whether you have phone a friend phone your sponsor or someone or people or whether it's family if you have a good family but somewhere outside your bubble that you can reach out to when you need it. I think that's really key. Lovely. 
Rachel, just to, just to wrap up before we go to questions, did you have anything else to add to that at all? Just some... I would, yeah, totally echo what everyone said. I think those safer, kind of developing safer working environments, so be that not having, you know, not having to play a gig um, in a pub late at night as your first experiences of being in a band um, would be would, would be great. You know, yeah. a gig in the afternoon that's not late at night would mean that you all have to go out till two o'clock in the morning. Um, and yeah, having those positive activities built around gigging or being in the studio, I think definitely. Um, but yeah, no, I would I just echo everyone and busting yeah. in the myth as well. Um, well, thank you all so much for your insight and your 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 um, sharing your experiences. We've got a, we've got two questions, um, and we'll we'll do our best to answer them. So the first one is: <clears throat> Is there support for people who have left the music industry and who need ongoing support? Thinking particularly of those in the six in their sixties and beyond who were part of the industry in the seventies and eighties. Um, anything you guys are aware of out there at all? Um, you know what, I was going to, I mean, you might be better placed to answer this one, Norman. Again, it's signposting, isn't it? But I'm just thinking about the peer group, um, the community that I'm part of. We have all sorts of different people there, and we definitely have people there who are retired or about to retire. Yeah. I think the music industry is a whole nother addiction. <laughs> and a really hard one to give up and it's part of the package so um, and I get the sense that that's what this person is asking that you know sort of they will be in the industry and now they're not in the industry and as you said that that whole thing can be quite addictive as well mm -hmm. so um so join Susan's um well, peer support group. whether it's that or, or someone else but I mean the thing is you know I do think so many people have left the industry um there are definitely um I want to think of a better word than refugees but there's definitely people that have been kind of chewed up and spat out come out the other side um and I think you have a unique viewpoint if you've worked in this world um and yeah there is a danger of the us and them thing you know like Jack was saying about whether you can relate to some or someone can relate to you if they haven't been an addict. Um, I think um, it, it's finding your tribe, isn't it? Mm. Really? Yeah, and I might add there are, there are um, support groups out there as well um, <clears throat> and um, support groups that, that cater to musicians themselves. And, and I'm, I'm thinking more like 12-step support groups that, that are out there. And I'm not for minutes suggesting that 12-step fellowships are the only way to recovery and all that. But within the 12-step fellowships, there are specific groups and some of them are, are musicians inclined. So it might be an, an option for, for you, for the person who's asked that question as well. Um, another question, oh, someone says, hi, Susie, you rule. And the group, was and is a big part of my recovery. We're all on the trudge, many too, way too many words. Um, the question was, I started a book, booking agency in January 20 and got sober in May 20. My recovery has been through COVID, which is strange, and by far the most challenging thing I've ever experienced. I found this idea of fellowship and connectivity to be the most effective for me. My question is, how do I maintain this connectivity, especially with the world starting to open up and travel, starting again, et cetera? And so I guess the individual is saying they got connected online and it's now, how do you, you know, how do they um, sort of maintain that connectivity now that we're starting to open up and we're going about our business? And I guess the answer to that, Susie, is that your your online group is still going, and it's. I know. I'm, I'm seriously. <laughs> it's not a plug for my peer group, but um, that's been the weirdest thing. I'm no one more surprised than me that um, what's become really obvious is um, it is really disjointed. 
when you work in this business, it's really isolating. And sometimes you're with an amazing group of people and it's just brilliant and everything's brilliant. And sometimes for no reason at all, you're with a group of people and you just don't fit in and you find out there's a WhatsApp group going and you're not on it and everyone's gone out for dinner and you haven't been included. And, mm. um, and that happens whether you're actively out gigging or whether you're off the road for whatever reason. And I do think, again, it's back to connecting with a group of people. Um, and there are lots of support support groups running now and um, yes yeah. yeah, so we're still going we still meet most weeks nearly every week actually we miss the odd one um and we just get online and chat um and people can have their cameras on and off uh on or off there's no obligation you can just listen yeah um, and weirdly i've even found out since that some people just come and listen i never know who they are and then yeah. some come up to me at a festival and say hey that was really useful so um yeah clearly there is a place in the industry for there's opportunity for connection. We need more of that too. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, that's no, no, that's brilliant. No, and I and I really hope that that satisfied that question. Um, who for the person who asked that question? I really hope that you found the answer in what Susie has just said. Uh, one more question: Do you find that the problem is harder when people stop work or touring? And I guess the I guess by the problem, they mean sort of the drink problem or drug problem. Um, I I would say no. I would say that the I think that the, you can find yourselves in. I say the situations are the situations or the environment's different, but it's almost like you. And I think you'll know this as well, uh, Norman, is that it, it doesn't really matter what situation you're put into, you can find a way to still be active <laughs> yeah. with an addiction. You know, you could have a really great, you could be having, you know, a really great time and out celebrating and be on tour and playing loads of great shows and, and then be drinking and celebrating because of that. Or COVID has happened and you've moved somewhere that was like, I moved somewhere that was really quiet. Cause I thought, you know, when I'm not on tour, it'll be nice to be somewhere quiet. And I like was just, obviously like everyone else was just stuck inside in a place where there was nothing nothing happening um and that's obviously a situation that would make you want to to drink or take drugs or whatever and i feel like there are always the environments that you find yourselves in can either be seen as new environments bad or good or they can just be they can be used as a catalyst just to create new excuses that are basically the same the same excuses mm. you can use anytime i think um for you know like before i said a, a friend died of taking drugs so my reaction was to take a load of drugs you know it, it doesn't mean that th there's never this one safe perfect space that is easier to be sober in than another space so I would mm. say that it's it's about figuring out how you exist in in every environment um but mostly how you exist in your own head really without because that's the whole thing isn't it it's like you you get you take drugs and you drink to not be in your own head, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it's about staying in that and being in your own head and figuring out how you can decorate the inside of your mind rather than, you know, how you can escape it, I suppose. Yeah. And, and I guess sometimes it really is about just, you, you know, you say it's staying in your mind and staying in that space. Sometimes it really is just about that, isn't it? Like, it hurts sometimes. That's yeah, the reality. Yeah. And, 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 and acknowledging that actually it hurts sometimes. And maybe you just need to stand in one corner and hurt like hell. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and knowing that actually it will pass. And that's the difficulty. Sometimes we, we sort of take that drink or that drug before it passes mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing. Yeah. So I guess, it's, you know, there's one thing about the support that's offered, but there's also something about the addicted individual who's now in recovery having to take some, some responsibility for the choices they make. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Listen, we've got a few more questions coming. I don't know what you guys, how you guys are for time. If you have a few more minutes, do you have a few more minutes to spare that we could take? Yeah. Is that all right? Okay. Um, Lynn, can we, um, okay. So here's one. I've been through the classic industry highs of the, the classic industry highs of the record of the record industry and now run my own agency and keep falling off the wagon. 
I wanted to ask what you find are some good coping mechanisms to stay, to, to stay positive and not fall back into addictive habits. So this individual is asking about coping mechanisms. How can they not fall back into the, those old ways, so to speak? And I think we kind of touched on that, didn't we, um, with your response earlier, Jack? But is there anything else? Um, I would like to know from, I think with this, I, I would like to know from either Susie or Rachel, from anyone that they've experienced um, addictions with, because obviously it's more of a broad scope than me just thinking about my own experiences. I think, is there anything that you guys have seen um, that has been effective um, in ways to help people cope with things and, and any things that you've seen that people may have thought was a bright idea and has just led to them falling off the wagon, I suppose. I don't know if you guys have anything. Um, I don't mind going first. I guess I'll always say find support um, because I think when people are isolated and they're trying to, and obviously I don't know this person who's asked the question, um, what happens when you fall off the wagon? Do you reach out to anyone? Is this something you go home and <laughs> drink a bottle of wine on your couch on your own or, or whatever it is you do? But I think, and I mean, again, whatever your, your way of supporting yourself, whether that's 12 step or, or having a help group or someone you can call either before you fall off the wagon or, you know, when you realize you have and it's like okay I've done it again how am I going to pick myself up how am I going to carry on and and get back with the program um I don't think you can do this stuff on your own yeah always need help and I, and I think that's one of the key messages I'd like to 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 pass out there to it's there's something about connectivity isn't there and, and sort of having a sense of connectedness to others having a sense of purpose I'm um, trying to do that on your own it's not gonna um necessarily be the thing you need you know for for the person who, who, who asked the question I would really strongly um, say to you try to reach out and ask for help ask for support if you can um, sometimes that's hard it really is hard but if you just take that that first step and reach out for support there are um, peer support groups out there and if you, if you want to leave your email address in the, sort of, in the Q&A, we will certainly follow up with you and offer you some guidance in that, in that, in that regard. Um, yeah, it's a tough one. It, it, it really is a tough one. And I, and I get it. I hear it. You know, until an individual gets to that place, we talked about it earlier, that sort of moment of clarity where you think, actually, that's enough now. Yeah, it, it keeps happening. And, and maybe if you're in a, in a group where there's support with people who are like-minded, who are actually go along that same journey, um, that might be helpful. Um, one final question. How do we change? Well, there's two questions. The first one is, how do you help someone who refuses to acknowledge their addiction and accept help or support? And I mean, I I could I guess my my response to that really is supporting someone in addiction requires commitment. It's tiring. It's frustrating, especially if they don't want help or can't. Or I wouldn't even say can't won't, but at this moment can't really see the reason why they should get the help. Um, I would say the first bit, the, the first and foremost thing is to try the best of your ability not to blame the individual. Recognize this as a disease that the individual has. It's not a choice they're making. And the second one is um, try to approach it from a non-judgmental standpoint. And again, um, try to have some sort of empathy where the individual's at, recognizing that the individual's not doing this because they're choosing to do this. 
there's a lot more going on. And, and, and I'd really highly recommend that you attend our addiction and recovery workshop so you get a better sense for what they may be going through. Um, yeah, not an easy one, actually. But, I, I, you know, I just, I, yeah, I'd say just hang in there. Um, support the best you can. And finally, I'd like to also say try to have some boundaries around what you will accept and what you won't. Try not to get them to drag you down in there with them. Um, those are my, my, my um, that would be my advice to you. Um, I would say from a, from uh, an addict's point of view as well, is that like addicts of any kind of, are really, really annoying. We're so annoying and, and we are untrustworthy and we lie and we then charm you into thinking we haven't lied and and haven't been untrustworthy and we have and i think it's totally fine to feel frustrated with people mm. i think you can go and shove your head into a pillow and scream in it because someone won't listen to you or take your advice whatever it's totally fine if you are really annoyed by the person that is an addict or that, that won't get any help. And I think cutting yourself some slack behind closed doors allows you to have more patience with someone else because it, the patience can be completely outward. It doesn't have to be, you know, you can tolerate someone's behavior. You don't have to fall in love with it. I think the issue is a lot of people seem to think, oh, how do I learn to love and accept blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you love the person. That's why you're helping. The addiction mm -hmm. is that you have to be friends with. That's something you're challenging. And I think what you said about having having boundaries there is great because you're not being judged for um what's happening but it's like like anything like any job or any situation you're in you have boundaries there because you know when to not overstep a certain thing and i think if you do that then you can be held accountable addiction or not for for that situation you can be like look i said i wouldn't do x y or z and i did and that allows the person that's the addict to almost have this little moment of guilt and clarity that isn't judgmentally forced on by someone else. It's them themselves. They recognize mm. the behavior that they don't like, that the other person doesn't like. And sometimes that is enough to flick a switch and they, they want to get sober, but they, they might, you know, think about changing their, their uh, state of mind, I suppose. And it might be one more step towards their recovery. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So one final question, and I'll throw this out to all of you, whoever wants to answer this one. It's a classic one, really. How do we change the sex, drugs, and rock and roll perception? <laughs> so I'll, I'll just, yeah, whoever wants to answer that question, um, it's over to you. <laughs> um, make water cool? I don't know. Like, <laughs> I'm going to stay, uh, start with the start with the kids from the bottom up and try and change their kind of, or not change, kind of support their perception of the industry so that we're breeding a new, <laughs> a new, a new breed, um, mm. a new culture that's uh, not so old school. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, and I think, I think that what you're talking about there, Rachel, is prevention, really. You're talking prevention, and we're starting with the younger ones and exposing them to something different is, is what I'm hearing. Exposing them to something that's very different to perhaps what was happening in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Brilliant. That's all the time we have uh, for questions. Um, if we haven't been able to answer all of your questions, we'd love to follow up with you. So please, please, please send us an email um, and we'll do the best we can to follow up. Remember, our helpline is it's, um, available Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. And again, the, the, the uh, link to that is in the chat. And, and, and the number as well, sorry, the number <laughs> is in the chat and the link to music support is in the chat as well. Um... This is it, folks. Listen, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for your openness, your honesty. Thank you for your insight. Uh, thank you, Jack, for your willingness to share uh, your own personal journeys. And um, again, just a reminder, 
for those of you who work, who work in uh, music and live events, you can attend our addiction and recovery workshop for free. It's a four hour session um, with the next dates being the 15th and 22nd of November and the 12th of December. And that will be the last three for the year. If you visit our website, you can sign up um, from there and we'll be in touch with you. Finally, remember that music support is always, always, always here for you. You can find out more about us again by visiting our website. And again, thank you so much to you guys who are on the panel. Thanks you for those of you who have joined us. And I want to leave with just one final statement. We've talked a lot about um, the fact that addiction is not a choice, um, but recovery can be if people are given the right opportunity and the right sort of guidance towards the support services. So let's champion that cause. Let's get on board. Let's get on board with action on addiction so that we can end this stigma once and for all. Thank you guys and go well.